like uh, we lost Emma there. There she is. Um, so uh, we're happy to introduce Christy and George today. Uh, Emma, do you want to take it from here? I see you're back. Sorry for the technical glitch there, everybody. Can you hear us, Emma? Oh. Emma, can you hear us? You, I think you might be muted. Oh, yep. Yeah, sorry. I'm just trying to share the screen again. Can you see that? Yeah, okay, perfect. Okay, so um, I'll just give us some introductions and introduce yourself, and then we can get started. So, George and Christy are the co founders of Roots Without Borders, a nonprofit organization with a mission to create, promote, and cultivate environmental initiatives which foster cross cultural sol solidarity, respect, and understanding. George has worked as the assistant country director for Trees for the Future and project manager at both Alma Mater Education and the Kumasi Institute of Tropical Agriculture. George has a degree in agriculture education and has used his background and his passion to coordinate and plant hundreds of food forests, teaching nurseries, in schools and communities across Ghana, West Africa. He's represented Ghana as a youth delegate at environmental symposiums across Egypt, Kenya, and Burkina Faso. George currently lives in London, Ontario with his partner, Christy. And Christy has a BA in Environmental Studies and International Development, which brought her to Ghana for school, where she then stayed and worked with George at the Kamasi Institute of Tropical Agriculture and Alma Mater Education. As well, she volunteered with Trees for Futures and the Ghana Permaculture Institute. Since moving back to Canada, Christy coordinated the residential tree planting program and assisted on the school program at Reforest London and is now the educational project manager at Growing Chefs Ontario, which offers food education programming to get kids excited and healthy about healthy food and exploring food systems. So now I will stop sharing my screen and hand it over to George and Christy. Thank you, Emma, um, and welcome to everyone. Thank you for joining us. Um, I'm just going to... Um, Sorry, I'm going to share my screen as well. Um, just one second. And let me know if you can see this or if there are any technical problems. Um, and we'll get started. So thank you for that introduction, Emma. We're super excited to be here today. Um, as Emma said, we are going to be answering questions and answers throughout, so feel free to pop your questions into the chat box at any point, and then we're going to take breaks along the way to answer them. Um, if we don't have time to answer all the questions, we can also stick around for a few minutes afterwards um, if there's a good chat going on. As well, we don't pretend to know everything in the world about food forests, so if you have your own experience to bring to the table, also feel feel free to share that in the chat box as well, because we'd love to learn from you too. Um, so we are going, oops, we are going to start off with a quick poll. Um, and I don't think I'm able to share polls. So Emma, would you be able to share our first poll, which is to get a feel of what your experience level is with food forests? All right, so you should be able to see that poll up right now. So inquiring means that maybe this is your first time hearing about food forests. It's a new word for you. Um, beginner means that maybe you've already started researching some species that you would like to plant in your own food forest someday where you can find those species. Advanced means that you've planted at least a little bit. And expert means that you have a full-fledged food forest going on somewhere in your yard or a school you've worked in or as a community project. 
So if everyone's finished, um, Emma will share those results with us. Perfect. So about half of people would say beginner, a little less than half are inquiring. Probably I'd say that means one person is advanced and no one's an expert. So awesome. You are exactly where you're supposed to be in Food Forest 101. Um, so to get things started, um, we'll use the chat box. So if you could tell us, um, this is a silly one, but tell us what your favorite actually not your favorite edible plant if you were an edible plant what would you be and then on a more serious note why you're interested in taking this webinar um so if you see me looking down out of the corner of the screen it's not because i'm scrolling through facebook right now i'm looking at the chat box um come in so that we can help answer your questions um i see someone says that they would be a strawberry beautiful thank you um, so while you type in your answers, I'll ask George, what would you be if you were an edible plant? Yeah, I would be moringa. And what is moringa? Uh, moringa is a superfood and um, it has a lot of health benefits as well. And it kind of help diversify income of most of the people who have really uh, work with. So I love moringa. And I always want to choose Moringa. Yeah. And if you haven't heard of Moringa before, it's a really um, quick growing drought tolerant tree um, that you can grow really well in Ghana and across a lot of tropical countries. So I see some more answers. People are coming in to say dandelions. They're here because they want to learn more. Blueberry, apple, they're here to learn anything we have to offer. Perfect. Um, so keep Keep putting your answers in. Ooh, whoever said mulberry, Chad, I love that answer. I almost chose mulberry as well. Um, I'm gonna go to the next one. I think, um, Brianne, is there a reason sharing is paused? Okay. I'm trying to resume sharing, but I think there's maybe a technical problem here. So I'm going to restart and try to share my screen again. Okay, can you guys see this? I think so. All right. Um, so we are going to talk about all these different topics. So we're going to talk about what a food forest is, the different layers, some history. George is going to go into um, some really amazing case studies of food forest um, that we worked on in Ghana. We'll share a couple specific to London for all the local people here. Um, and then we'll talk about the next steps that you can take to get started on your own food forest. We'll talk about species that you can plant and where you can source them. Um, so to get started, um, food forests, you may also hear them referred to as forest gardens as well. Um, a food forest is modeled on the edge of a forest. So the edge of a forest is the most diverse part of that for food forest or forest, I mean. Um, so you have your tall canopy layer of plants that are providing shade for a lower, lower canopy level of plants that like a little bit more sun, they're reaching out more into that open area. Then as you get farther away from those taller trees, you're going to have more shrubs um, that also like more light. Then you're going to have flowers, herbs, ground colors that really like a lot of light. Some of them like shade. So in that area, you have the most diversity because you have everything, all these different species that have different needs when it comes to sunlight. One of the really big reasons that people like to plant food forests is because they're very low maintenance. Um, they're not no maintenance though, which is a misconception sometimes. Um, you'd still have to put in some work to get a really established food forest. And we're going to talk about that a bit more in the next slide. Um, two of the really big benefits to food forests are their educational value and their therapeutic value. So you're not going to want to go and um, take a nice calming nature walk stroll through the middle of a thousand acre soybean field, but you might want to spend an afternoon strolling through a food forest and sampling different things, IDing different things. Um, it's got a lot of therapeutic value 
um, spending time in nature. One of the reasons that we're planting a food forest in our backyard is because we have um, a little daughter and we want to be able to take her out into our backyard in the future and have her learn about plants, get excited about trying these different things, learning the names of different things and how to identify them. And we want her um, to just it be a stone's throw away from us. So food forests are a really good outdoor classroom. Um, to compare them a little bit to monocultures, which is how we grow a lot of our food in North America. Uh, the main difference is that they are much, much, much more diverse. You have a lot of different species growing together, which means that they're also um, very resilient. So let's say you only grow soybeans one year and a pest or a disease or weather destroys your crop that's your livelihood and your income gone for that year or that season. Whereas with a food forest, you may have, I think um, someone is unmuted. So if Emma, perfect, thank you. Um, so if in a food forest, you had one of your crops wiped out completely, let's say you had apples and the blooms get killed by um, a late frost. You're still going to have 20 other species or 100 other species if you've got a really big food forest to fall back on as your source of income or your source of food for that year. Um, so that's what I mean when I say resiliency. Um, food forests are also really big on creating healthy living soils. So if you're only growing soybeans, they're going to be taking nitrogen from the soil and depleting that of nitrogen. Whereas in a food forest, you might have something that takes like corn or something that takes nitrogen. Um, sorry, I meant the opposite. I meant corn when I said soybeans. Um, so you might have corn that's taking nitrogen up from the soil, but right beside it, you're going to have a plant that's adding nitrogen back into the soil at the exact same time. Um, as well, like I said, um, food forests are lower maintenance and lower input than a monoculture. So monocultures typically need high inputs of synthetic fertilizers or pesticides or herbicides in order um, to grow. Um, and have high yields consistently year after year, but a food forest doesn't need a lot of um, outside or artificial inputs. For example, when you're starting, you might wanna add some compost to your food forest, depending on what the, the quality of the soil was before, but after that, you should be able to make your own compost and keep adding um, nutrients back into your soil without needing something from the outside. Um, you also don't usually need to water a food forest as much as regular crops after it's been established. Of course, trees need water the first few years to get established or in a drought. Um, but after that, in a season where there's a normal amount of rain, you don't need to keep watering the trees in your food forest every year. Um, you don't need to um, mulch forever because you can chop and drop um, branches, stems, roots, leaves, the parts of the plant that you're not going to eat, you can chop and drop those and add them right back into the soil where you are or tucked away um, um, so that you have space to grow. Um, as well, there's natural pest control in a food forest because you're creating habitat for predators like birds and things that are going to come and eat those pests that you don't want. Um, companion planting is a key feature of food forests. So companion planting means planting species together um, that enhance the growth of each other or repel pests. So um, a good example of that are the three sisters, which was common throughout um, different, a few different indigenous cultures across um, current day North America. Um, the three sisters were beans, corn, and squash. So the corn would grow up straight and provide a stalk that the squash could climb up. And then the corn would be taking um, 
nitrogen from the soil, the beans would be adding nitrogen back into the soil, and they all work together in synergy to help each other. So that's kind of um, on a bigger scale what food forests are modeled after. Um, and then as well, I said that um, food forests provide habitat for predators, but they also provide habitat for lots of insects that you do want, like pollinators. So food forests have different layers that I talked about um, when I mentioned that it's modeled after the edge of a, of a natural forest. So the first layer is the canopy layer. So the canopy layer is comprised of large fruit or nut trees. Um, it's usually over trees that are usually over 30 feet tall. And you don't have to have every layer in your food forest. So for example, our backyard isn't big enough to have a canopy layer. So we've skipped that layer altogether and gone down to the next layer, which is the understory layer, which is made of smaller fruit trees. These fruit trees are going to be 10 to 30 feet high. Um, and we are gonna talk about specific species later, so stick around. And then the next layer, um, the smaller layer after that is shrubs, things like berries, nuts, currants, those are gonna be like 10, 15 feet-ish. And then you have a herbaceous layer. So that's culinary and medicinal herbs, but that can also include your annual vegetables as well. Um, then the next layer is straightforward. That's your root layer. Then we have a, um, sorry, there was just a weird sound in the background. Then we have a ground cover layer, um, which is usually shade tolerant um, plants that creep along the ground. Um, they're pretty dense and they can suppress grass so that you don't have to compete with that. Then your next layer is climbers, um, also called um, also, you can say they're vines. So your vines may be growing up your trees in a bigger food forest, um, or you may have them against a trellis or an arbor or a fence um, as well. And um, if you get delve deeper into learning about food forests, you're also going to see that there's more layers than just these seven. These are just the basic layers. Um, some people include things like a fungi layer, a water layer, habitat for, um, for animals. So like I said, we're going to come back to some specific species that are really good for the London, southwestern Ontario um, area where a lot of you are from. Um, but first, I wanted to quick, uh, quickly touch on the history of food forests because we don't want to um, present this as a new thing that was just discovered and is like a, a modern technique. No, food forests have been around forever. So there's evidence of food forests across multiple continents, um, multiple groups of indigenous peoples. It, Food forests are common in tropical areas even now. Um, I wanted to share a really cool case study of a food forest in what we, what we call Canada now um, on the West Coast. So in British Columbia, Simon Fraser University published uh, a very interesting study. I have it linked at the end if you wanna learn more about it, um, but they came across an untended 150 year old food forest that was still thriving, even though it had been left alone for generations of people. Um, the food forest was full of different species. So there was crab apple, hazelnut, wild cherry, plum trees providing canopy for that lower layer of shrubs like cranberry, elderberry, hawthorn. There was a root layer with wild ginger, wild rice root. Um, the species diversity that was in that one patch of land was significantly higher than all the other coniferous forests 
which was native to that area there, which is one of the reasons that they can tell that it was planted intentionally. They could also tell that the groups of people that were tending it were using a lot of techniques. They were using controlled burning. They were using coppicing, which is when you cut things down to the ground to encourage more growth. They were fertilizing, they were transplanting, pruning, weeding. A lot of work was going into maintaining this food forest. And once it was established, it was able to keep growing. Um, probably a little bit kind of out of control now, but I think it's really interesting to learn about the history of these food forests um, and to learn from um, what previous generations were doing on the land. So I've just talked for a really long time. So we're going to take a break now. Um, so you can ask us any questions you want in the chat box. I see lots of people have been talking. Someone knows the Moringa tree, which is fantastic. Yeah. Ooh, someone volunteers at the food forest in a city park. I would love to know what city, what park. Um, amazing. Perfect. Okay, so I'm going to go on to the next slide, but, oh, perfect. We have a question. Okay. How long does it take to make a food forest? So do you want to answer? Yeah, so um, uh, food forest is a kind of um, uh, in, in, in different forms, just like Christy explained. But your food forest can be based on either your problem solving approach or no. So the kind of approach that you want to take it, that will be able to determine. So if your food forest is to be able to help a depleted soil, to regenerate itself, then it's going to take you within three years for, for you to see the soil coming back to life. Um, if your food forest, you know, it also depends on the climate where you are planting them. So if uh, the, the trees or the crops you kind of identify uh, takes a long time to grow, it also can. So, you know, within the tropical zone, I would say within three years, your food forest can be a full size develop you know, uh, a garden or a farm. In Canada, uh, based on the type of um, climate we have here, you know, uh, tree crops takes a bit of time to grow. And uh, I think Christy can also be able to tell us how most of these trees grow, but I, with the tropical experience, I can be able to tell you that within three years, you can be able to have a full grown food forest either uh, your approach is a soil base or is an income base? Yeah, um, to add to what George said, I would say um, if you're looking at fruit trees like apples, peaches, pears, plums, it's going to take several years for those to um, get a significant yield. But I mean, we just planted um, raspberries, um, service berries, elderberries that we got um, that were probably four, five, six feet tall, and they already have some immature fruit on them. So, and we just planted those a few weeks ago. So that's, that's a start. I'd say that's a food forest, just a, a very mini immature one. Um, so feel free to keep asking your questions in the chat box and we'll come back to them the next time that we have one of these breaks. Um, so we have one more poll and then George is going to jump into the case study. So Emma, if you could share our next poll, that would be awesome. So what type of food forest, um, and this can be in theory, what type of food forest would you plant? Would you plant one in a community, in your community? Would you plant one in a school? Maybe you're a teacher, maybe you're a student, or are you daydreaming about a beautiful food forest in your backyard? It looks like most people chose private yard, maybe two or three are interested in a community food forest and one person um, in interested in a school food forest. Um, I would love to hear from the person who said school or the people who said community. Um, 
Do you work at a school? Do you work at a community organization? Tell us in the chat box. Um, so now I am going to hand the reins over to George, who's going to share some case studies um, from projects we work on. Thank you, Christy. Um, so our case study approach is uh, more of getting the job done, uh, kind of. So um, uh, with this case study with Amamata Education, it's uh, one of the cool projects that we kind of work on. And it was cool based on the concept that we decided to choose a food forest as part of the, um, the problem solving approach. So with Amamata Education, uh, we had the opportunity to establish a senior high school uh, that was based on giving half scholarship to students and uh, giving the rest of the students who are going to be paying school fees. So our goal was to be able to bring in extra income that will be able to solve, uh, help, um, you know, run the school. So uh, in terms of how we were going to be able to solve the issue, we came out with a food forest. So we had a 31 acre of land and we decided to use uh, the rest of the land to be able to develop a, a food forest that was going to give us an all year round uh, food uh, supplies and uh, also give us enough food that we can be able to feed a student and sell the SS uh, on the market to raise, raise extra income to support the school. In our, in our approach, you know, uh, the land was, uh, we bought the land from you know, previous owners, so we had to be able to, first of all, identify the kind of soil that we were going to plant our food forest on. So we took samples of uh, the soil from various vantage points of the land, and uh, when took it to the soil lab to be able to test and find out exactly what are the nutrients, uh, the nutrient in the soil, the ones that are missing and the ones that have been abandoned. And uh, the results from the soil uh, sample test gave us the opportunity to also be able to identify the kind, the kind of crops or the kind of tree crops that are uh, supposed to be planted within uh, the section of the land based on the results we had from the soil test. We also had the opportunity where you know, there was a, a stream that was passing through our land. So we had it as a, an advantage to be able to use it to water our crops all year round. And the long-term goal was to also have a solar pumping, uh, um, a solar pumping, uh, system that will be able to supply water into the farm all year round. So our crops that were uh, selected based on our food forest were based on two things, uh, income and also uh, food for the student. Um, so we decided to select food that we can be able to use to feed a student and then be able to sell the SX to be able to raise enough income to support the school. So we selected crops like cassava, plantain, bananas, moringa, papaya, uh, pepper, okra, and garden eggs. And these were crops that, you know, based on our soil test, we deem it appropriate to be able to um, grow around or within this, um, the parameter of the land. And we also had other nitrogen fixing trees based on where we thought the soil were a little bit uh, low in nutrients. Yeah, in our, in our food uh, forest approach, in terms of building a sustainable uh, school and a sustainable uh, food forest, um, we, we had the opportunity to partner with Fair Afraid, which is a chocolate producing uh, company that um, in a contest wanted to produce organic chocolate. So when they first approach us, uh, uh, when they first ap approach us and uh, we, we decided to partner with them and incorporate their, their system where they wanted to buy organic chocolate from the, the students of our, the parent of our student. So what we decided to do was that um, because the, all the students' parents were farmers, we decided to incorporate certain tree species that were going to diversify the income 
uh, as well as you know reducing the amount of fertilizer that were, they were using on the farm so they can be able to save enough money to support their children in school and as well as they can be able to feed their children or their family from these three crops so that the long-term goal was that in the year round they were going to be able to make multiple incomes instead of making one uh, stream income from their cocoa production so uh, fair Freak was able to partner with us and then we raised a, a tree nursery with different varieties of uh, tree uh, crops that were given to the parents of the farmers to be able to plant in their farms to raise extra income to be able to support their children yeah so uh, i also had the opportunity to work for trees for the future um, and in trees for the future you know we had uh, in our food forest uh, problem solving approach we work with students we work with communities and we work with individuals as well so in our school uh, based project what we do was that we partner with schools that um, most of the children are interested in uh, solving environmental problems and also are more interested in climate change. So Domiabra uh, Junior High School happened to be one of the, the schools that we decided to partner with and we set up a school park club. So the school park club was mostly like friends of trees or friends of uh, urban agriculture, friends of food forest, who were kids who were more interested in uh, food forest. So what the goal of this student were to be able to uh, design a food forest with specific trees of their own choice. So every member of this student had a specific significance of a tree that they were more interested and more, uh, they all love to have the tree in the garden. So what they did was every student planted a specific tree and then made a, a sign with their, their names, the date the tree was planted and was just as significant to them because they were more like, oh yeah, this tree is something I always want to grow and see it growing as well. Or these trees are trees that I always want to come back after school to see them growing. So based on how these kids were very much interested in food system and in tree planting, we were able to get them uh, occupied based on uh, doing a lot of tree planting and having so much fun uh, uh, gardening. And another interesting part was also um, most of the proceeds that were made out of their forest garden were sold to the parents uh, of this student to raise money to support students who happen to be the needy among the, the club members. And also, they also used to cook some of the food uh, on their uh, breaks to be able to sit together and eat as a family. So I believe the food forest uh solving other problems were also bringing the children together was also an education platform for them to learn about plants and the food system yeah so um the club members uh for three pals because they were very organized in the way they do we had the opportunity to do a big uh rally in terms of raising awareness for world environmental day and their the topic they wanted to base on, uh, to focus on was, you know, instead of us doing so much talking, we should rather start planting to save the planet. So this is a demonstration site where students, you know, uh, select varieties of crops, tree crops they are interested in, you know, and then uh, we work in a garden together, you know. So as a demonstration site, working with students, we always want to be with them so that because food forest design is a whole system where, you know, especially if you are working with community or school base, it has to be very engaging. It has to be, you know, uh, an approach where everybody is part of the team. Everybody is part of the family to make it, you know, the kind of food forest family we are looking at. So these are students who have so much passion for the environment and so much passion for the food system uh having their garden ongoing this is another case study in the northern region of ghana which happens to be uh, one of the difficult projects we embark on and the goal for this food forest was uh, infertile uh, soil and also dry soil in the northern region the northern region happens to have the highest uh, sun uh, in terms of uh, climate so 
the soil is always dried. And then, uh, so in our discussion with the community, the goal was to be able to revitalize the soil. So uh, revitalize the soil after years of monoculture without synthetic fertilizer. So uh, in order to make this problem solving approach uh, work, we decided to prepare the minds of the, the community by doing workshop engagement where we have to then begin to explain to them how long their food forest is going to take and how long their soil um, is going to take to rebuild back so that you know farmers or the, the community will be able to understand uh, the process it takes to develop a food forest, the process it takes to develop, uh, to rebuild back their soil so they can be able to have multiple incomes from the, the, the food forest design. So concern were raised by far, uh, most of the group members and uh, their concern was that uh, the trees that we're going to plant is not going to take over the land, which you know was a very important question. And the question was that a food forest is a design. So if you plant a tree and you just leave the tree to grow, it grows to be a big tree. But if you grow, uh, if you grow a tree and you, you maintain the tree to grow the way you want it, it's really leave, you know, it's able to grow to the size you want. So our concern was to be able to prepare their mind and also give them all the tools and the equipment or the training they needed in terms of maintaining their food forest and as well as they know the step, every step in the way. So um, in, in our workshop and in our designs, we had a farmer who uh, volunteered his farm for us to be able to use for a demonstration farm uh, site where we planted. So in his course, in his state of the farm, there was a problem like we discussed the uh, soil uh, depletion, the land was dried. So we decided to select species of trees that were one, we're going to fix, put back nitrogen in the soil, two, going to uh, serve as a shade uh, to be able to prevent the sun from uh, having direct sunshine on the land. So we can also have enough water retained in the soil for continuous cropping and continuous farming. With our continuous training and support, the demonstration farm or site garden begin to take shape. So we saw uh, in our third year going, we saw the soil was beginning to uh, yield very much result. The income or the crops yield were increasing based on the, the food forest approach they were doing. Their soil was building back. The community began then to gain confidence in the food forest and then begin to replicate it in their various farms uh, uh, among the community members that were all uh, part of the, the food forest demonstration site. Yep, thank you. So I will leave you for Christy to continue. Uh, and I'll be here as we go on with all the questions and answers. Yeah, so if you have any questions about those community and school projects, pop them in the question box because in about two slides, we have another break that we can answer some questions on. Um, so those were projects from Ghana, but a lot of you are in London or in Southwestern Ontario or Ontario. So we've got two studies that case studies that are, that are a little bit closer to home. Um, we didn't personally work on either of these projects, but we're very inspired from by them. And we chose them because they are on public land. So you can go check them out on the weekend, take a little trip with your family like we did this weekend. Um, so this one is a really beautiful example of a community food forest. The Wood Street Park food forest is in Kensington Village in London. This is Gabor Sass, one of the community members and leaders on this project. Um, it was designed by Jessica Robertson um, of Wildcraft Permaculture. If you live um, around London and you want someone to consult or help you design your food forest, she is amazing. She's someone that has a ton of knowledge on um, food forests and she has a permaculture workshop coming up soon um, an in-person one so check that out as your very next step um, but this food forest is on public land so like i said you can go check it out um, if you are checking out a food forest project on public land just 
be um, respectful and don't go and bring your buckets and harvest everything. You can taste a couple things just to try. Maybe it's a new species that you've never tried and you want to get a taste for it to know if you want to plant it. But don't take everything. Um, leave some for the kids and the families that live in that area and the volunteers that maintain that food forest. This is another really cool example, the Carolinian food forest. Um, we went for a walk there this weekend to check it out. Um, it's on hold right now. Um, so it isn't as maintained and as, as, um, as kind of an experience as it once was, but they have a very cool blog that you should check out, especially those people that said that they're interested in starting a community food forest because it outlines all the different steps in starting and maintaining this food forest. So it is on one acre of land. It's on, in a public park. Um, it's attached and surrounded by wild conservation land. It was a really collaborative project between um, the city gave them the land, Reforest London, um, the local tree planting charity was involved, a lot of community associations and community members. Um, again, Jessica from Wildcraft Permaculture was involved, um, and so many other actors and stakeholders were involved, um, which is the case when you have a really good community project, there's going to be a huge list of partners involved. Um, it was planted in 2012 by a giant group of volunteers. They planted all native species, so fruit and nut trees, um, things like ostrich ferns, silverweed, yellow birch, gooseberry, red raspberry, spice bush, um, choke cherry, American plum, um, some species that we don't normally think of as edible species, but they are. Um, and so this is another picture that's our us and our little baby Adeline on the weekend. We had a beautiful walk through the Carolinian food forest. You can see there's a little social area there, um, uh, some recent plantings. Um, there used to be um, informational educational signage as well. Some of that's been vandalized, which is one of the risks when it um, comes to doing a community project. Everything doesn't go perfectly or according to plan. Um, but while the um, food force was active, which you can track their progress through the blog, there was a ton of activity going on. There was plantings, there was prunings, there was invasive species removal, um, all done with volunteers. There was educational workshops, foraging walks, maintenance work bees and social events. Um, there was a partnership with a, a nearby school where the kids would come every year. Um, to work on the on the food forest. It was a really amazing project um, and hoping that it comes back to life again soon. All right, so we can take another question here if anyone has it. Oh, we have people saying beautiful family. Your baby is adorable. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, yes. <laughs> Um, and then Brian says that they've got some webinars. She's talking about Jessica from Wildcraft Permaculture. Yes, you have um, access to recorded webinars from Jessica. She has um, a bounty of knowledge to share about food forests and permaculture. All right, okay. You can ask questions, but if not, we're going to go on to the next section because we really want to get through all this information so that we don't miss out on anything before eight o'clock hits. Um, Christy, there was just one question from Chad about any advice for overcoming creeping Charlie or other invasives uh, because mulching isn't working. Just wondering if you guys have any tips for that. Sorry, I didn't miss that one. I didn't scroll back that far. Um, I haven't worked with Creeping Charlie in particular, um, but with a lot of these creeping plants along the ground, you're going to need a lot of persistence. I'm sorry, I don't know about Creeping Charlie in particular. Um, you can sheet mulch. So if you're referring to mulching as like wood chips, stuff like that, you could try sheet mulching with cardboard. Um, 
big sheets of cardboard, you want to take the pieces of tape off them. Um, try to get ones that aren't like glossy because um, you want it to be able to decompose. Um, but you're also going to have to put some effort into weeding it for maybe multiple years. I'm sorry. We have some gout weed in our backyard that I'm not looking forward to having to deal with over the next few years. Um, but that is one of the first steps in starting your forest garden is dealing with all the weeds that are unfortunately there. Yeah. And uh, another thing is that with uh, food forests, I think they begin to take care of themselves you know, as the, the system begins to grow, to uh, grow the cover crops, the tree, um, the canopy crops will begin to. So it's kind of a system that sometimes, you know, readjust itself as time goes on, right? So uh, especially like if you want to do like pest control like this, there are certain crops or trees you need to grow to be able to repair certain insect or be able to, uh, bring in the, the right insect for pollination. But as a food forest, you know, things doesn't really take uh, take in charge in, within the first year. So hopefully in the second and third year, you might be able to see a lot of the results that you are looking at in terms of, you know, uh, being able to uh, control itself. Uh, Sorry, I hope we have answered, at least started to answer your question, which is it's going to take a lot of work. Yeah. Um, so the next steps in designing your food forest, once you have a plot of land that you want to plant on, um, you're going to want to observe. That's the first step. In permaculture, they say to observe your land for an entire year, all four seasons or two seasons, and depending on the climate, so that you can see um, things like which areas have more sun, which areas have more shade, which areas are really dry, which are really wet. Um, you might not expect just from living there for one season, things might surprise you um, when it comes to the fall or the winter or a spring after a big snow melt. Um, you're going to want to look at what types of soils you have. Is it clay, sand, loam? Is there a bunch of gravel? Um, you're going to want to look at um, what's existing there right now. So if you have weeds you're, or invasive species, you're gonna want to look at removing those first. So um, I have George here, he's our invasive species um, remover. So he spent many, many days this spring because um, we just moved to our house in the fall. So this is our first season here. He spent a lot of time removing um, invasive European buckthorn, which is another one of those species that's almost impossible to kill. It's like a zombie, you cut it down and it keeps coming back over and over again because it can grow from um, any roots that are left there. Um, so you wanna look at what you wanna get rid of and what you wanna keep. There might be some plants there um, that wouldn't have been your first picks, but you might wanna keep them or you might wanna take them out. Um, some, when, when we moved in, um, there was some invasive species, but then there's also some non-native species, um, some like ornamental things like flowers and stuff like that. So this year we decided to leave those things because there's lots of open space we can plant, but maybe as things get more crowded, we'll take out those, um, those non-natives or those non-edible plants that, were, that don't serve um, our practical purpose anymore. Um, you want to look at the existing structures that you have there. So is there a fence, a house, a shed, things like that. Um, you want to research. So while you're doing that observation for a year, be researching, be taking classes. I, I recommend if you live in London, go check out the Living Centre. It's just outside of London. They have a huge... Um, eco, I think they call it an eco spiritual center, and they teach lots of classes on forest gardening and permaculture hands on stuff um, that will be starting up again after the pandemic's over so that you can really get into things. Um, you can also make a little site map of your area where you draw um, 
what things are going to look like at the mature size. So sometimes when people plant a tree, they make the mistake of not thinking about how big it's going to be in 15, 20 years, and then there's not enough room for it. So when you draw your sketch, make sure you're looking, you're drawing the mature sizes of trees. Um, you don't have to start with a whole food forest. You can plant just a couple plants at first. Um, I'm speeding up a little bit here and I might skip some things because I see we only have a few minutes left. So I'm going to skip to our next slide. Um, I'm not going to read through all of these, but you are going to get the slideshow um, to refer to after. These are plants that like to grow around London or similar um, zones, um, southwestern Ontario. Um, so I've broken it down into the different layers. These are some species that I highly recommend you look into. I'm going to skip this question and go to the next slide and we can come back to it um, for anyone that wants to stay after. But I included some places where you can source your plants if you live um, some of these are London specific, some of these are Ontario. So Thames Talbot has a plant a native plant only fundraiser every year. Um, it just ended yesterday. Um, so look for that for next year. Reforest London has free tree depots um, with a lot of native species. They have like elderberry and serviceberry, um, like things like chokecherry. There's one going on right now for this season, but there'll be more in the fall. Um, I've included some other um, garden centers and tree nurseries that you can check out. A cool one is um, the Ontario native one that I included there. Brianne actually just told me about this this week, but you do online orders and they're they will deliver it right to your door. I checked it out because we we're going to order from there. The prices are actually really reasonable for being able to come right to your door. So check those out. If you're not in London, um, places all over the world hold CD Saturdays and CD Sundays where heirloom varieties and really unique varieties of seeds are um, swapped and sold. So look up your, late, um, your local version of a CD Saturday or Sunday. Um, there's some sources. And thank you so much. Um, so if you do stick around for the next few minutes where George and I are able to answer more questions, we want to hear from you in the chat box or you can unmute yourself and we want to know about what you would plant in your food forest. Um, and I'm just going to go back to that, that um, slide of all the different species there. Um, and I'm sorry, Emma, I've only left you one minute if you have any closing remarks to make. <laughs> No, that's okay. Uh, we just wanted to say thank you so much for joining us. And yeah, hopefully you guys have more questions and um, found this to be a very educational webinar. Thank you, Emma. And thank you, Brianne. All right, so we know some of you have to leave. So thank you so much for joining us today. Um, we hope you learned a lot. Um, check out these species when you when Brianne emails you the slideshow after, and I believe you're getting the recorded version as well. Um, there's a lot of really cool species. Um, we, George, do you want to tell them about what we've planted in our yard while anyone um, asks some questions here? We can tell them. Sorry, I was just checking uh, on the chat box there. Um, so in our yard, like I said before, we skipped the canopy layer and we went straight to the understory layer because we don't have enough space. So we have um, a mulberry tree as our understory la layer. They make beautiful fruit. It's kind of like um, a more mild, less, a little bit less sweet blackberry. It's a really delicious fruit and a really bountiful tree. Um, there's an invasive one and there's a native one. It's hard to get the native one, but I recommend you try to plant the red mulberry if you can get your hands on it, because that's our native species. Um, it's almost extinct because uh, the white mulberry has wiped it out. 
Um, for our shrubs, we've planted service berries, we've planted raspberries and elderberries. Brianne recommended we plant some hascap, so I'm going to try to get my hands on some of that. It's a really interesting fruit. I haven't tried it yet, but we have a lot of really delicious native fruits that you should check out. Um, our herbaceous layer is not there yet. We have some rhubarb, but we're planning to plant um, lavender, mint, some yarrow chives, things that we have growing in pots or in other parts of our garden. We're planning to um, transplant to our food forest um, maybe in the fall or maybe next year. We just want them to get a bit more established first where it's easier to water them. Um, our root layer, we have some chives right now. Um, ground layer, we have some ground strawberries. And then our climbing layer, we don't have right now, but that's okay. You don't have to have all the layers and you can keep adding things um, in the future. Sorry to interrupt, Christy. Um, we just have a question. Do you have any experience with growing from cuttings? Um, for example, elder cuttings? Um, I have some experience growing lots of house plants from cuttings, but I haven't tried to grow like fruit trees from cuttings. But I know um, that George does have experience with growing things from cuttings in Ghana. Yeah, um, so uh, mostly it depends on um, the kind of like uh, tree or cutting you want to. You no, know, sometimes you can develop the root base from the, the parent's tree or sometimes you cut and develop the root base, you know, outside the parent so that you can be able to, you know, uh, as soon as you get a root developed, then you can be able to transplant it. Or you can grow in a, a, a jar with the water around it and keep changing the water as time goes on so that when it develops the root, then you can be able to transplant it to wherever you want it. Good question, Brienne. Ooh, Madison says that they just planted Hascap. Madison, if you're still here, tell me where you got it because I would love to get some. <laughs> That's okay. If, even if you have a secret source, just private message me, Madison. <laughs> yeah. All right. Um, <laughs> Does anyone know where to get Papa? Um, when I worked at Reforest London, and this was like three years ago, we got our Papa from Cannadale in St. Thomas, and they were really nice ones. And then Reforest London was also um, giving them out. But um, I heard from Brian that it's harder to get some fruit species this year um, to give away at their treaty depots. Yeah, we haven't been able to find pawpaw for a couple of years from our regular suppliers. That's not to say they're not out there elsewhere, but we haven't seen them from our regular suppliers in a couple of years. So they're, they're tricky. Mm -hmm. Pawpaw is a really cool one because it looks like a tropical fruit. Like it looks like a, a weird deformed mango and it tastes kind of like a tropical fruit too, like a really overripe banana slash mango but it's completely native to carolinian canada so that's one that we're also trying to get for our yard too and just be mindful um, that a lot of these species of the fruit trees and shrubs that we mentioned they do need two species or uh, two different varieties of the same plant in order to be able to cross pollinate so research each of them to make sure that you need, if you need one or two. Or if you don't have room for a second, make sure that someone like a few doors down has one. As far as uh, rooting, I did root some uh, gooseberries and red currants and it was very successful. And I did that over the winter. Like I took a cutting just that winter time and had a box in my room and just rooted them all. Nice. And uh, that was the winter before last winter, so 1.5 years ago. Yep. And now some of them are bearing fruit this wow. year. Um, I didn't harden them off quick uh, enough because I was rushed. And I thought maybe they were dying in my box, but they weren't. 
Um, so they probably would have been even more productive if I had hardened them off correctly. Yeah. So yeah, it was just something I did over the winter. I don't know anything. I just tried it <laughs> and it worked pretty good. So awesome. awesome. I would say yeah, 80, 80, 90% of the cuttings rooted. Great. Yeah. Yeah. And success. And Leanne is saying that um, she planted elderberry last year and then a branch broke off and it's rooted itself and is growing this year. So that is fantastic to know. It's easier than you think, I guess. All right. So I think we might call it a night. Thank you so much Thank for you. joining us to learn about food forests and to share your knowledge with us as well. Um, and go check out um, the permaculture workshop coming up, the in-person one with Jessica from Wildcraft. And hopefully we will see you again in another webinar later. Thank you. Thank you. Joss the berry worked for me too. I just stuck a branch in the ground. Nice. <laughs> awesome. All right, everyone, have a great evening.